But first, I'm handing you over to Tom's service for Schubert Lab. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, welcome to the first of your three essential investigations into Schubert's life and music today. Schubert the Wanderer today, so let's have our lab project. Today's question. Welcome to the Schubert Lab. It's Wanderer Day today, so here's your lab project. What was Schubert looking for, and what did he find? Pretty good questions, those. And my lab assistants this morning to answer them, Laura Tunbridge from the University of Manchester and Jonathan Cross at the piano from the University of Oxford. So, Laura, coming to you first. Look, the, the, the point about this, the whole thing of Schubert as a wanderer, OK, as an individual, as a composer, a musician, he's looking for something in, his, in, in himself and in music, but there's a, a sort of bigger tradition of wandering and this, this figure of the, the wanderer, der Wanderer, in, uh, in early, uh, early Romanticism, early 19th century German ideas. There is indeed. I mean, the stereotypical uh, view is the paintings of Caspar David Friedrich, where you have the solitary figure with his back turned to the viewer um, on top of a mountaintop, and that idea of being alone, communing with nature, is something that's important. But I think it's important to remember, and the Haydn Resline song that we just heard reminds us of that, that it's not always about kind of solitary brooding, but sometimes about a more joyful appreciation of nature, perhaps in response to sort of increasing urbanisation and a bourgeois nostalgia for the countryside, feeds into that wanderer tradition as well, which we can find in poetry and paintings and so on. So how does, does Schubert do, deal with this, this figure, this, this personage, <laughs> with the idea of wandering directly in, in his music or, or in the poems he sets? Both. Um, he uses the figure of the wanderer um, within some of his instrumental works, in the wanderer fantasy, for example, but also he chooses poetry that often is concerned with a wanderer figure. And you can see that throughout his career from the mid 18 teens until the end of his career in Winterreiser. So it's something, he, I mean, it's something he is uh, sort of, uh, you know, I was going to say genetically attracted to, but it's something he feels attracted to in, inside himself to, to engage with somehow. Yes, you can see that partly as a response to the poetry and the world around him, but also I think because in some ways the wanderer allows him to explore new musical terrain as well. There's a sense in which the wanderer is um, exploring different landscapes and Schubert can sort of do that in musical terms too. Now, Laura, you've, you've got an example for us, then, a setting of a poem, Der Wanderer. Yes, this is a setting of a Lübeck poem from 1816, Deutsch 489. And this is interesting because it sets up um, both some of the musical features that Schubert will use later in his Wanderer settings, but also shows him at an early stage kind of engaging with the Wanderer tradition. Uh, just tell us about the text bef before we hear it, I mean, because it's, it's a text that makes it absolutely explicit this idea of, of searching, looking for something. Yes. Um, at the beginning, the Wanderer is coming down from the mountainside, and then in the second verse, it goes on to say, The sun seems so cold here, the flowers faded, life old, and all speech is empty noise. I am a stranger everywhere. Now, of course, Winterreiser is going to begin with the idea of being a stranger everywhere. So we see Schubert already engaging with that idea. Um, but this song also plays with the inflection between major and minor, which is something, again, that Schubert will use in his Wanderer songs. OK, so other places that, that he's finding musically to, to wander, to creating this terrain. Let, let's hear this song now. now Deutsche 489, Der Wanderer, Dietrich fischer Disco and Joe Moore. Part of Der Wanderer, Dietrich fischer Dieskau and, and Gerald Moore. Oh, land, where are you? And Laura Tunbridge, the, the point is that Schubert uses this song and, and then makes it part of a, a major instrumental work. He does, and he takes some of those same ideas of remembering a landscape of friends and flowers and so forth, which he gives in the major key in the song, and transplanting that um, in sort of motivic kernels into the Wanderer fantasy, which he composes some six years later. 
Um, it's, I mean, is that, so that, in a way, that's a, a journey that this this music makes in itself. I mean, there's the journey that, that Schubert, uh, the, the music that Schubert uses to describe that internal journey, that sense of see uh, seeking out in the song, mm. which then goes on a journey itself in his imagination and, and in the and in the Vandora fantasy for, for piano it becomes something else. Literally, is taken somewhere else. Yes, you can see the song infiltrating the instrumental music here, but also. Um, he returns to the song, particularly that second verse that we heard at the beginning when he's mm. talking about the sun turning cold and feeling like a stranger, is heard in fuller form in the fantasy at the beginning of the adagio section. We sidle into that from what's happened in the first movement, um, and that's one of the sort of formal ways in which Schubert is playing here with the idea of what a fantasy is and what we can do with an instrumental music. OK, so this is really multi-layered exploration going on here. Let, let's have a listen. Alfred Brendel, a Wander Fantasy. Alfred Brendel playing part of, a short excerpt from the, the slow part of Schubert's Vandor Fantasy. Uh, Laura Tunbridge, uh, thanks for the moment. Look, Jonathan Cross is at the piano. Uh, Jonathan, th thinking about th this thing about uh, the, the way that Schubert creates an idea of searching, of wandering uh, in, in his music. I mean, th there are ways that, that, he, that he physically does that with the notes he's using. So in other words, you know, not just imaginative things, but actually technical things that we, that we hear as journeys that he takes these notes on. How, what does he do? Absolutely. Well, if I may borrow your microscope, uh, Tom, and just <laughs> take a look at a very, very small moment to pick up precisely the themes that Laura's been talking about. Mm. Here we've got Auf dem Flusser on the river from uh, Winterreiser. So we have this lonely, solitary figure uh, wandering, across, uh, wandering across the landscape, but also remembering. And Schubert sets it up absolutely brilliantly. As Ian Burnside was talking with you yesterday morning, we have here a brilliant musical representation of this frozen, brittle, cold uh, landscape. Uh, pianissimo, staccato. In fact, there's, there's no rhythm at all. I suppose all you can hear is the, is the tread of the wanderer walking across this frozen landscape. At the beginning, it begins very simply, like this. And then the singer comes in. Um, at that point. So you can see you've got this wonderful representation of, of the frozenness. In fact, harmonically, it's very straightforward. It's yeah. absolutely conventional, the kind of thing you would have learnt from Mozart or even from Bach, you know. Yeah. That's very, very simple harmonic progression. That's home, if you like, the tonic key. There's one interesting thing there we might want to talk about. That one chord that isn't quite the same. Yeah. Uh, that that a, oh, a minor yeah, yeah. chord to which he adds an F sharp just suggesting something more poignant, something darker, something deeper, more painful. In fact, that's a chord that later in the 19th century took on a history all of its own, if you think of... <laughs> that Tristan <laughs> chord. Of, Tristan chord. So it's the same chord, but in fact used in the form that Wagner later used it at the beginning of Act 3 of Tristan for a desolate seascape. So in a way, so taking the, the, really a similar idea to, from, from what Schubert is doing at the beginning of that song. Look, let, let's just hear a bit of that song that in, in context of uh, what happens next in uh, Auf dem Flusser. Uh, here's uh, Mark Padmore, the singer, and Paul Lewis on piano, Auf dem Flusser. <laughs> Du heller wilder Fluss, wie still bist du geworden, gibst keinen Schein von Gruß. Mit harter starrer Rinde hast du dich Deckt, wie's kalt und nass. 
Padmore, the singer, and Paul Lewis on the piano. Jonathan Cross, uh, more importantly, more importantly than Paul Lewis, well, in this context, yes, is at the piano for us in the Schubert lab. Uh, look, Jonathan Cross, you've got this great idea about how Schubert goes uh, uh, through the through the mirror, journeys to the other side of the mirror, with often with a single note. T tell us, <laughs> tell us what you mean. And well, you he could hear that. that happening beautifully there. I, mean, I think Mark Paul, Mark Padmore has it nailed. He understands the melancholy of his music. So we've heard how uh, Schubert sets up the home key of E minor. And then, so we hear, uh, so first of all, the singer tells us about the how the river was uh, mm. uh, rippling merrily. And there's the dominant of E minor. And then suddenly, just by changing one note, he moves the bass down a semitone. And we're in this entirely different world. As if he's flipped through to the other side of the mirror, you know, and he's suddenly looking at the world in an entirely different way. It opens up this entirely new landscape, or rather, it's Schubert going in, it's the kind of internal landscape see, that Schubert discovers. See, the wonderful thing about that as an idea, really, to listen to all of Schubert's music throughout uh, Schubert, the Wanderer Day for us, is that when, I mean, his music is full, Laura Tunbridge, of these moments where that kind of thing happens. And the, the point is, Jonathan explains how they happen, physically, technically, but they, it means something. I mean, this becomes a kind of experience, a kind of knowledge. In a way, it's about the joy of getting lost <laughs> and suddenly discovering an unexpected vista. So, yeah, and uh, which he's able to give us with these just incredibly simple things. Yes. Uh, Jonathan, this, the, you, on, in a way, that happens on the smaller scale, chord to chord, but it also happens on, on the bigger scale of, of whole pieces, especially in the late music, perhaps. But uh, I mean, there, it, it means something bigger in Schubert's life as well. Absolutely. So, I mean, this is a very small moment, but you can find them, and you think of the, the, the way the music turns in, say, the, the, B, the late B-flat sonata, or you can get these kinds of moves in, in the unfinished symphony, which carries exactly the same kind of meaning. It's kind of you know, it's on a threshold between two worlds does, in which it turns. Jonathan, does that relate to 20th century composers or uh, ideas? Ah, well, I mean, the reason I chose um, Mark Padmore to sing there was because I think he gets that melancholy. And if you think of some of the other things he's be been performing re recently, Schubert, Dowland, but also Britain, Winter Words, there's Schubert everywhere through that song, Bert Whistle. And I think the 20th century in particular has found this kind of melancholic strain running through later Schubert fascinating. And to my mind, this leads links with this 20th century obsession with Orpheus. We see that in, in Stravinsky after the Second World War, in, in Bert Whistle. There's a kind of Orphic figure here wandering across this winter landscape, lost, lamenting for mm. a past that can never be regained. So Schubert is, is in a way the Ur, at least early 19th century Orpheus. Jonathan Cross, Laura Tunbridge, thank you very much. And a reminder that tonight in performance you can hear the Vandor Fantasy played by Paul Lewis and Paul Lewis and Mark Padmore singing Die Schöne Müllerin. More from the Schubert Lab at three o'clock and at quarter to six. Get in touch as always, schubert at bbc.co.uk. We are, of course, part of Essential Schubert. Uh, Sarah, the journey continues. Thank you, Tom. Fascinating to hear Schubert's harmony coming in.